Your mercy, we're grateful for your grace. We honor you. Hallelujah. Let's just give him one more praise. <laughs> While you're standing, let's give God praise for my si Minister Karen and Minister Ezrik, our leaders. That's my brother and sister, man. I love them. Ezrik's right. I'm going to get him back, but it's okay. God is good. We thank God and for Reverend Charlotte, who's with us as well. Let's give God praise. God is good. You can take your seat. I'm going to try and get through this as quick as I can. Um, I was asking God what to speak, and I think, you know, how many of you enjoyed Youth Conference? Let's start there. Wasn't it amazing? Um, God has blown my mind, and the miracles, the testimonies have been incredible. And I was asking God, you know, when you come off a high like that, what to minister? And... Um, um, truthfully, it was, we went to Doncaster, maybe a few, what was that, probably about a month ago now, and um, it was myself, Caleb, Emmanuel, Terry, and Michaela, and um, I think it was the first time a couple of them have come with me on any kind of ministry engagement, um, and they were like, yeah, so you know you have to minister this at youth, and I was like, imagine, they're trying to tell me what to preach, rude. Um, but I realized um, they sent something that I delivered there that needed to kind of be said to us as a house. So I was like, I'll pray about it because I don't believe in just preaching a message because I can. I really believe in asking God for what to minister. And he gave it to me, but he gave it to me from a little bit of a different perspective. So I'm going to come from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today on the subject, the cost of the call. Cost of a call. And I really believe that it's going to bring some clarity to the last few weeks after conference, okay? So let's go to Act 16 for time. Um, verse 16, if we can get it on the screens, that'd be fantastic. And then when you've got it, let's just stand in respect to the reading of God's word. Act 16 and verse 16. While I get in it, I'll just pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to hear from you. Father God, I decrease that you may increase in me. Make my tongue like a ready writer to pen into the hearts of your people. Father, you are so God that you can minister to everyone at the same time. So I ask right now, Lord God, that you will... Allow me to give clarity to what you have spoken, Lord Father God. And I decree and declare that someone's life will be changed because of it. And we honor you. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts 16, verse 16. It's on the screen. Great. And it says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her master's much gain by a soothsaying. Say, soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and Christ, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. Say, many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace, onto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Let's run down verse to 26. It says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. We'll stop there. So, as I said, I'm going to talk to you on the subject of the cost of the call. So, turn to you and say, The cost of the call. You may take your seats. Um, so, when I was thinking about this, like I said, we've come out of a Blaze Youth Conference and what kind of stirred this up? Um, I was talking to Minister T. Um, wow, well, I was giving everyone towels. Tisha and Sister Caleb, Brother Caleb. Well, you never know. Um, um, talking to them guys after they ministered, and I felt impressed to tell them to watch out for the week. And I, you guys can testify. I said to them, I said, now that you've delivered such a weighty word, watch out for what the enemy is going to do. And. Um, in the week, both of them called me and was like, you're not going to believe the madness that has kicked off in my life. And one of the things I think is my, I don't know if pet peeve is really the right word, but I'll say that for now, is that I find that we are very good at doing church, but really bad at life. Really good at doing church, really bad at life. What do I mean by that? In the sense that um, a lot of us were good to praise God here, but the moment we get home and life hits us, it's another person. And I'm not saying something that I haven't walked through myself. So, you know, as you lot know, everything I talk about is 
something I've walked through. And one of the things that God spoke to me was that he was like, I need my church to be awake. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? He was like, they're sleeping. There's a lot of things that the enemy is doing that's happening in our lives that don't have to happen. But have we, had we been awake or have we been sensitive to what's going on, we would put a stop to it. And so when I was looking at the dictionary word for sleep, it means to be inactive. It means um, careless, unalert. Um, it also says, and I like this one, it means to lie dormant. So the first thing I thought about, thought about a volcano, a dormant volcano means it has the ability to erupt, but it's not in full work right now. And so what I was realizing, it's not that we don't have the potential to be awake. It's not the, uh, that we don't have the potential to be alert, but some of us are numb to experiences life that we're actually asleep. And so I was like, man, we need to be awake. And I was like, God, what do, what do we need to do? And he brought me to this scripture, Acts 16, and it says, as it came to pass and they went into prayer, a certain damsel um, came who was possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, um, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So the first thing that we see is that as they went into prayer, this thing kicks off. And so the first thing I want to, I want to educate, I guess, today is more about education in the sense that if you are a praying believer, the enemy is going to fight you. And I think sometimes we have the mindset, I used to have this mindset, like if I don't attack him, he won't attack me. That's a lie. Every time you open your eyes, he is ready to attack because you are a reminder that there's something to be done. And so the first thing you have to realize when you walk in prayer, when you are a believer, when you serve God, the enemy is going to attack you. He's going to come. He's going to show up himself. So we see that as they went into prayer, the scripture says, a spirit of divination met us by soothsaying. And I was like, okay. And we see this. Um, and he's, when I look at the word divination, there's a lot of big words. So I'm going to break them down. What does the word divination mean? Um, in the Greek, it's the word puthon. But basically, it deals with a regional demon. In other words, it controls an environment, a region. So if we were to put this in, in this setting, there's a demon that controls Kilburn or controls Walthamstow or Brixton, all right? So there's regional demons. This one was a soothsaying spirit. Um, spirit. So soothsayer means to foresee the future. Enable, you're able to foresee the future. A person, listen to this, who speaks truth. So what she was saying was not actually inaccurate. She said, these men are servants of the most high God, truth. But the challenge was the spirit behind in which she was saying it. This is why we've been teaching you guys about being careful who prophesies over you, being careful who speaks into your life. Because we've got a lot of people and we've counseled a lot of people who hear the word of the Lord and it's inaccurate. In that the spirit behind it is wrong. So you have people because they want to be a preacher or they want to do something, they find people who will prophesy that thing to them and actually that's not the case. And then you end up force riping yourself in terms of going ahead of what God has said and then you're upset with us when we're not giving you the mic or we're not giving you the opportunity. But the truth of the matter is, is it time? So here we are, she's saying the truth. These men are servants of the most high God. Imagine for days, the Bible says for days she did this. So days she was following, saying these men are serving the most high God who show us the way. She's saying this over and over again. And I started to think about, I like to put myself in a situation so I can understand it better. Let me help you. It was like, I have a God child and I looked after her one time and she was like, oh, I've got this song. And I was like, all right, let me hear it. And she was like, I know a song that gets in everybody's nerves, everybody's nerves, everybody's nerves. I know a song that gets in everybody's nerves and this is how it goes. I know. And she did it the whole car journey. And I was convinced I was going to hell because I was going to beat this child. Because it was driving me insane. I couldn't concentrate. I was taking wrong turns and everything. But the truth of the matter is, that's what the woman was doing. She was going on and on and on. And the Bible says, Paul being grieved, in, in other words, he got fed up. He was like, I've had enough. The scripture says, he was being grieved, and he says, you know what? It's time to come out. He says, I said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, and he came out the same hour. All right, let's, let's, let's break this down. So the first thing is, he spoke to the spirit. He didn't speak to the person, he spoke to the spirit. Here's the danger that we also have is sometimes people are going to do things that are inaccurate, are going to do things that are wrong, and we measure them by them. 
and not realize there's a spirit working behind them. We should love the person by the spirit. So you have to be in a place that you recognize that is this the spirit or is this the person? So the first thing is he, he binds the spirit. The next thing that came out, and I, I might get in trouble with this, but I don't care. It says it came out the same hour. This is why I have a challenge when people were like, yeah, 12 weeks of deliverance. I can't get my head around it. Because for me, every scripture, it was a day, same hour. And I know that if deliverance is really going to take place, it shouldn't take you long. And the only reason when they, they said, the disciples said that the spirit could come out. Why? Because they said, these kind come out by prayer and fasting. So my question is, are you praying? Are you fasting? Because maybe that's why the spirit won't move. Because the Bible I look at and read, it says if you command the spirit, it will respond. It was the only time when you see a scripture and say, Paul, I know. Sarah, who are you? Because you, you don't have a relationship. So the reality is, if we are really walking in power, if we are really walking in authority, demons are scared of us, not us scared of demons. You shouldn't be going to your school and say, oh, you know what, I don't know. You should have authority and go to school. I command every principality in this school to recognize I am here. I was telling my, um, some of them guys, I, and you know I always chat on my business in the terms of like what I used to do in school. I remember mean, one time I went to school and there was a, a, um, one of the boys and he was completely manifesting. And I went to a Church of England school, you don't speak in tongues at my school, but do you think I cared? When I saw that demon manifest, I said, Rebel, because I was gone. And they wrote home and was like, your door was speaking in gibberish and da 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 da. But my thing was, you know what, that demon ain't coming home with me. And I'm looking for young people who say, you know what, I know wisdom, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, I serve Christ. And I'm not ashamed, I don't care who looks at me funny, I don't care who's my friend at the end of the day. Because guess what, the same friends that are laughing at you are the same ones that will call you when they need help. You lying like, ready for me, okay. So the Bible says he was grieved, let me move on. He was grieved, he got tired of hearing the same thing, says command you to come out. Now, here's, here's where it gets interesting. Verse 19, it says, And when the master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew him to the marketplace and say, These men do exceedingly trouble our city. Now, this baffled me because one girl's deliverance mashed up an entire city. One girl, right, mashed up an entire city. So when I looked at this, the scripture says, he saw that their hopes and gains are gone. Okay, it's that kind of them old English. Let me break it down. They were bankrupt. So basically what was happening, if you look at the history of the text, they were making money off of her predictions. And that's why it's a dangerous place to not know who you are because people will make money off of you. They will take advantage of you. You've got to know who you are and whose you are so that no one takes the mick, no one makes money off of you, no one abuses who you are. So the Bible says their hopes and gains, they didn't care that she was free. They just cared that they had no money, which is so sad. So she gets her freedom and they drive hit them into the marketplace where everyone is to make a noise, to make a fuss and say, these men exceedingly trouble our city. Here's my other problem. How do you trouble a city and it's one girl? But you remember what I said at the beginning, the demon that was operating in her was a regional demon. So when she got free, she loosed the spirit over the country, over the city, and they got mad because they no longer had access. Do you understand, when you got free, when you got delivered, you didn't just lose yourself, you lose your family. When you got free, you got delivered. You didn't lose just your, um, your neighborhood, you lose your area. You don't think it's about Ruach and just individuals. It's not about that. Our name is Ruach City Church, which means we take over the cities of London. When you stand up, when you speak, angels start moving. When you respond, enemies start aligning themselves because you have power. So the scripture says they exceedingly trouble our city. I looked at that word trouble, Tarso, and it means to stir up, to agitate. In other words, they got on their nerves. And so when I looked at this, it brought me to this point where here they are, they've troubled the city and they've ended up in jail. Can you get ready, get my chair. They end up in jail and it baffled me because I was like, they didn't do anything wrong. All they did was loose a girl and now they're in jail. And then it hit me because the reality is when you become a believer, when you answer your assignment and your call, it can get you into places that you don't deserve. 
And this is the hard part for me because not a lot of preachers preach the bit where you have to deal with things because of your call. Now, here's the thing. You'll sit there and say, oh, well, you know what? I'm not called to preach. Calling is not about preaching. That's not what the definition of a call is. The de- Let me explain that to you. Ezra, come here. Why did you come? Why? But why did you come? Exactly. Because I told him to. I called him and he responded. Does that mean he wasn't called? Does he have a mic in his hand? Is he singing? Is he preaching? No, he just came. So anytime you step in here and you responded to what God said concerning your life, you are called. We've complicated what calling is. We've complicated and we've made it um, fanatics and church Pentecostalism. Calling is being called and you responded. Simplified. So when he came, I called him, he responded. So everyone in here is called. The truth is, did you respond? But when you respond, sometimes the response to the call gets you in a prison. Gets you mash up in jail and you're like, what did I do? And so what God started to show me, I had this dream and it, I was seeing certain people and myself included in life. And he showed me, as you guys know, I'm always a demonstration. Which leg is this? So he showed me a vision and in a vision, I was wearing like prison clothes. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And in the dream, I saw this and I was like, why am I wearing prison clothes? And God said to me, "Um, you're in prison. And I was like, I'm in prison. I thought maybe, because I dream and I'm quite prophetic, I thought, am I going to jail? I'm like, what am I going to jail for? Is it my speeding? Is it, did did I tell someone off while I was driving? What am I going to jail for? You know, you start overthinking. So I'm really nice letting everyone pass me. And I see police smiling. And I thought I was going to jail for that. But God was saying it's spiritual. And he was saying, he said, when you answer the call, this is what you look like. Every time you laid hands on someone and prayed their strength or poured oil on them and called their destiny, not only are you fighting demons that are associated to yours, but every demon that was associated to every person you've ever prayed for is coming after you because you freed them. They're angry because of what you've done for their life. And so the worst thing is we come to church and I look like how I looked before, but some of us look like this. The Bible calls it a prisoner of hope. Paul says, I feel like I'm a prisoner of Christ. I have never understood that statement until this year. I watched, as you guys know, some of you saw, I went to New Birth and I ministered and everyone was going on, like, oh my God, the prophetic, da 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 the healing. And I was like, it was a turning point for me because I really saw God show me who I was. But when I got home, all hell broke loose. And I'm not just saying, you know, that my car didn't start. I'm not saying that's not a bad thing because that's the enemy. But I mean, everything that could go wrong could go wrong. I mean, to the point where there was one point money got taken out of my bank and I didn't know where it went. And I'm like, Regine, where's my money? And I was saying to God, I said, what's going on? I said, what's happening? And God said to me, oh, did you think new birth was just going to be... That's it. And you thought you was going to be fine when you came back. You've got every enemy that was over that city in that region going mad because of what you did. And what I realized was in in my season, I said to myself, God, it's not fair though. What did I do to deserve that? He said, well, you answered the call. And this is what I want to show you because I'm sure, in fact, let me ask you, after a youth conference, how many of you felt like everything went a bit mad after? See, look at that. Did you think that you were coming out of a blaze conference and the enemy was going to do nothing? Let me help you. He is fuming, mad, angry, agitated because he recognized I can't stop these young people like I used to. I know that they now finally know who they are. You know how we know we talked about being activated the last youth, um, youth takeover. The enemy's mad because this is the first season where you recognize who you are. We saw so many young people get prophetic words. We saw so many young people get clarity. And so now the enemy's mad because you're no longer in the dark. 
You're no longer not knowing who you are. But here's what we have to deal with, the cost of the call. This is the life. This is the truth of the life. You want to preach? Can you look like this? Because everyone thinks and sees the planes. Oh, do you see when you were Bishop Jake's though? That's sick. Bedroom. But do you see when I'm falling apart in my room saying, God, I, I wish I never did this. Do you see the truth of when I'm laying hands and saying, God, how comes that person got healed, but I'm still the same way? Do you see the truth of when you say, God, how comes you can answer them today and I'm still praying on the same thing from two years ago? This is the stuff people won't tell you, but I will tell you. I'm going to tell you it's going to cost you everything. It's going to make you feel like you're losing your mind. It's going to make you wonder, God, am I even on track? It's going to make you lose friends. It's going to make people hate you for no reason. It's going to make you say, is this worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Sat here, says myself, before conference, I told my youth leader, I said, I said to Ezra and Karen, I said, I ain't got nothing to give this week. I said, I'm on my last. I'm on E. I, I don't have anything. This is how I look. I'm mash up and I've got to go into conference and try and preach. Then what killed it? Let me help you. So Saturday... I have the audacity to trust God and prophesy to the entire church and tell them by September the 1st. And I've been getting miracles, testimonies in my DMs while the enemy has going rampant in my life. And I'm watching everyone telling me all these incredible testimonies. And I'm saying, I wish I didn't say a thing. Because while they're celebrating, I'm paying the cost. I'm paying the cost of responding. I'm paying the cost of saying yes. I'm paying the cost in my every day. So here we are, Paul and Silas. They're in prison. Did nothing wrong but deliver a girl. Sitting in prison. And they do something that is incredible to me. Um, they do this and they go, let me show you what they did. The Bible says they started singing and praising. Now before I get to that bit, I want to help you because... Here's the thing, you didn't do anything wrong. I want to kill that, because that's the first thing the enemy did, says, you did something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. You were just called. Let me tell you why the enemy wants you to get frustrated and abort your calling and your assignment. Listen to this fact. So a study shows that, and I'm using it as a representation, that females' bodies, when they're frustrated or irritated or overwhelmed, they produce an enzyme that stops them getting um, um, penetrated for birth. So in other words, even if the semen goes in into the woman, she will not produce because her body lets off an enzyme that stops production. So if that happens in the natural sense, the enemy is smart enough to know if I get you angry, overwhelmed, you'll start speaking. You'll start saying stuff. You'll start saying, God, I wish you didn't call me. And knowing that life and death is in your tongue and you eat the fruit thereof. So he doesn't have to do anything. He'll let you kill your own destiny. And that's what the enemy is doing. But I decree today that every word, everything that you've spoken will be annulled in the name of Jesus. I command the war angel Michael to fire out every word that you've spoken. It will be cancelled and you will fulfill your destiny, your purpose, your calling in the name of Jesus. So I realize the enemy is trying to prevent and stop. When I, when I looked at the word cost, the Cambridge Dictionary says amount of money needed to buy something. But listen to this. It means to be forced to give or lose something in order to obtain something. In other words, in order for you to get something, you have to lose or give up. So if you know you're called, you will lose and you will give up. The other definition, it says um, to suffer or to lose something. And I know that to be true because the Bible talks about suffering so much. He says to die in Christ is to gain, to live, um, to, die, to live, Jesus, to die in Christ is to gain. So when I looked at this, I said, okay, this is interesting. But God says this to me. He said this and I was praying. He said, listen, my grace is sufficient. He said, I considered my grace before I allowed the test. And he said, I would not let you be attacked on this level if there wasn't enough grace for it. He then showed me, he said, just like the chairs that we have here, the chairs are made to hold you. The chairs are made to carry the weight of who you are. And the fact that chairs can hold you up should let you know that if he gave you grace, the grace is there to keep you and hold you. 
In other words, I considered the weight load before I brought you into the prison. That's what he said to me. So we hear that we see in verse 25 that Paul and Silas is praying and singing. Now, I don't know about you. If I went to jail for something I didn't do, my first response might not be praying and singing. Just being straight. It will now because I've read it. But that wasn't going to be my first response. Imagine, and you know what? This is how you know they're dangerous. You ever gone, like, have you ever, in school, right? You ever meet some people, there's people that can fight, and there's some people that can't fight. Like, I always say, if you've got a lot of talk, you probably can't fight. Like, I'm going to beat you up, man. And like, okay. You're still talking. And then there's some people that, they don't talk. Yeah. You just be like, I'm going to beat, pop, smack you in the face, and it's done. But yeah, I'll give you another example. You ever, like, I don't know, if you have those parents that, you know when you're in trouble because your parent starts humming? And you're like, oh, snap, someone's getting beaten. And they start humming, they start calming themselves down. But it's the same thing. The, the Bible says Paul and Silas were sitting in the prison and they were singing and praying. And I started to think about it. So one of the things that I started to do, when the enemy gets me mad, I'm, I'm not complaining. I started singing and worshipping. So I started saying, you are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. The Bible says they sang praises. They sang hymns. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. And to know the save the Lord. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every And I'm singing and I'm praying. God, I know you can do this. I don't understand this season. I don't know why the attack is so great but I know you can bring me through I know you got me I know you've got my back God help me to keep up help me to be strengthened put the right people around me who are sensitive to understand what I'm going through they sing and they praise they sing and they praise and they sing and they praise and they're not singing and praising because oh you're going to do something they're singing and praising regardless whether you take me out of this prison or not I know you've got me and it's crazy because we don't talk about the cost of call how do I know John the Baptist had his head on a platter and this is the one that prepared the way. Head on a platter. Imagine your end result is a head, your head chopped off. Okay, Peter got crucified upside down. So my question is, can you hold up, even if it means in the end times, they kill you for your belief? Because that's what we're walking into. We think it's all about coming to church. Of course, we can all be Christians here. But what happens if you're on the street and they say, are oh, you a Christian? If, you're, if you don't denounce Christ, I'm going to shoot you right now. Well, what would your response be? You know what, mate? I'm not a Christian. What they don't know won't kill him. But re- to be about Christ is not about what we see here. Being about Christ is beyond this building. Being about Christ is beyond what we do on a Sunday. It's got to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And so this week, I was getting frustrated. And my mom had to check me. She said, did you really think that prophesying September 1st and the enemy wasn't going to come after you? She said, Winnie, you didn't prophesy to an individual. You prophesied to the church. What did you expect? And as she said it, it came back to me. And I was like, you know what? She's right. And so I had to change my posture. God, I don't get it, but I trust you. God, I don't understand this, but I trust you. I know you've got my back. So the Bible says that Paul and Silas prayed... And then at midnight, can you help me? At midnight, all their chains, their bands were loose. There was an earthquake. Now, let me, let me explain this. That I looked at this scripture and I said, this is crazy. So the cost of the call, we get to a point in our life where things will happen and it may cause us to be in a place where we're in prison. But I love God because God will make sure that he has the last say. So I know some of you are in here and you're getting a bit like, you know what, this is, it's a lot, this is heavy. But you've got good news. The Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed begging bread. So the Bible says, at midnight, Paul and Silas are praising, and it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open. Here's this. So it says, and suddenly. When I looked at that word suddenly, it's not suddenly. It's the word alpha 
in the Greek. In other words, let's read it again. An alpha was a great earthquake. Let me tell you how you know it was alpha, because I've never seen an earthquake that's very specific. This earthquake didn't mash up the whole prison. It just only opened the bands, loosed the chains, opened doors. In other words, he made sure everything that was locked up was open. That's a very specific earthquake. But it makes sense because it was alpha in the situation because God does the foolish things to confound the wise. He made sure, he said, you know what? I know you went in there on my behalf, but guess what? I'm going to make sure that you're loosed. You know, I'm missing it. I said, he's going to make sure that you're loosed. So it says, an alpha was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Then it says, immediately all the doors were open. I think this mic is going. And everyone's bands were loosed. So alpha is a great earthquake. And then it says that the prison's doors were loosed. Right, when I look at the word earthquake, it's the word great agitation. Great agitation. Now remember I said, the word trouble at the beginning, they troubled the city. That word trouble is agitation. So in other words, although the enemy agitate, was agitated, although they were upset, God says, I'm a greater agitator. I will make sure that, guess what? They know what trouble really looks like. So I'm here to let you know, let them label you, let them call you names, let them say different things about you, but it doesn't matter because God's about to trouble your trouble. You're missing it. I said, God is about to trouble your trouble. The things that the enemy is doing, running rampant, trying to get things um, out of place, trying to get you to speak against different things. God says, I'm about to trouble your trouble. I'm not surprised that he's trying to mash up my mic. It's okay, I'm going to talk anyway if I have to yell. So here's the thing. He says, he's a great agitation. He says, so that foundation of prisons were shaken and the doors were loosed. So in other words, when I looked at that word trouble, let me explain as well. It gives the, um, um, in a picture of a seed. So it says that um, agitation in that pictorial is like a seed. In other words, the soil, which in one instance is covering the seed, breaks the shell. So in one instance, it covers it. In the other, it causes what's inside of it to come out. We would have not noticed and seen what was inside that woman had not Paul and Silas delivered her. And what God is trying to do, some of these troubles that are happening in your life is not to get you out of place. It's not to frustrate you. But God says, I need what's inside of you to come out. I wouldn't have known the prophetic gift in me if it wasn't for certain people pouring into me, agitating me, troubling me. Say, so Winnie, what's the word of the Lord? And I'd be like, why are you calling my name? Pull someone else. But I wouldn't have known what was inside of me. So the Bible says... He says, so there was a great earthquake, I've got to finish. And it says, so that the foundation of the prisons were um, shaken and all immediately all the doors were opened. In other words, and it says, and everyone's bands were loose. This is what's amazing. They went into prison and freed an entire prison cell. An entire prison that had people who actually made a mistake, that did wrong. Because of their singing and their prayer, they got delivered. Which tells me, guess what? The enemy has been doing stuff, but God is about to free everyone that's connected to you. And not just people that are connected to you, but people that are in your vicinity. In fact, some of you, are, the people around you don't realize they're blessed. And they're walking in things because of you. Some of them don't realize your job is blessed because you're working in the job. Some of you don't realize because you're in that school, they're getting good grades and they're getting the tick from Ofsted. It doesn't matter what your sphere of influence is, but God said, because you're there, that I'm about to shake and open doors. I'm about to disrupt every plan of the enemy. Everything that's held you incarcerated, everything that's held you hostage, God says, I'm about to open. He says, I'm about to cause everything to be open, to be loosed. And then he says, I'm going to open every door. And guess what? He says, I'm doing it immediately. What does that mean? Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but now. Immediately means right now. So I'm here to let you know, guess what? It's September the 1st. Yes, I prophesied it, but there's some things that the enemy has been um, disobedient and doing stuff, trying to hold up your blessing, trying to hold up different things in your life. But God said, it's happening immediately. It's happening right now. I don't care what the enemy told you. I don't care what the Satan has been trying to speak in your ear. But God said it will happen immediately. Immediately. Turn to your and say immediately. I loved it because it says they're loosed. When I looked at that word loosed in the Greek word, it means Anna. It means a reversal. It means everything that the enemy did, it has to turn around. It has to turn around for your good. Genesis 30 says it this way. Um, you thought evil against me, but you brought it um, to, um, to this day to bring to life. Um, sorry. It says you fought evil against me and you brought, um, he says, it was talking about Joseph and he says, you brought it to this day to save much people alive. Joseph got put in a pit. He got put in a prison. But guess what? People's lives were being changed because of his yes. I decree that every 
everything that the enemy has done. Lives are about to be changed because of your yes. Lives are about to be changed because you answered the call. Lives are about to be changed. So everyone connected you will be blessed. I love it this way. Psalms 23 is one of my favorite. I, you know, I say it a lot. Thou prepares a table in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. In other words, when you see your enemies, your table is being prepared. I love that scripture because when your table is being prepared, it didn't say anything about your enemies eating. They get to watch you eat. So this is the season. The enemies, the people that have talked about you, guess what? He's about to bless you in front of them. He's about to let them know, guess what? I'm in charge. High five your neighbor say, I'm in charge. So I looked at this and I said, wow, but this is what blessed me. This isn't even the best bit and I'm done. This is the last point I'm going to make. The scripture says they get loose and you would have thought they would have ran out of prison, but they didn't. See, I know it's the enemy because this one's cutting out too. So he came and he loosed and he, they stayed there. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would stay in prison once I'm loosed. Deuces, I'm out. But they stay in prison and the jail gets, jailer gets nervous. He's oh my gosh. They must have all gone and he goes to kill himself. And the scripture says, they said, do no self, no harm. Then you got jumped all the way down. And then he says something that was, it blessed my life. And I don't know if everyone always sees this bit, but he said, he said, um, guess what? We're gonna let you out. And he says, Paul wouldn't budge. He told the officers, they beat us in public. And now you want us to leave in private. He says, no, no, we're not going nowhere. And the Romans said, they said they hurried. They apologized, watch this, they apologized and personally escorted them out. I'm here to let you know, those who put you in places of embarrassment, that have tried to embarrass you, put you in prison situations, God says they're about to apologize and they're about to take an ownership of what they've done and escort you out. That should add everyone shouting. I know we've all got someone who's made us embarrassed, made us feel bad, disgusted, whatever it is, God says they're about to take you out. That's why you've got to get to a place when you're, when people around you, they turn or it's always a bit funny or they're like, all of a sudden they hated you one minute and they're blessing you. Take the blessing. That's scripture. He said, your enemies are about to bless you. So I love this. He said, they escort them out. Um, and and the, in the message translation, it said escort. Escort, get the clip ready, guys. Escort means accompanying someone or something. When we think about escort service, we always think about people, uh, you know, being naughty. It's a bit that way. But escort service in the original term is not about them being naughty. Hold it, hold it, don't put it on yet. Just hold the screen, you don't have to put me on. Um, it means to escort, it means to accompany, it means to show. And um, one of the translations is to show a good time. This is what God's getting ready to do. He's about to escort you. Um, I love this because one of the other meanings for escort means protection. And it means um, when you have an escort services as a mark of rank. That thing bless me. In other words, some of you are about to change spiritual rank. The enemy has to actually come at you because you have a, a different rank, a different place in the spirit. That's why some of you feel like, why is the attack so hard? Who am I fighting? What is going on? God says it's an indication that you've changed rank. you change spirituality. You have a new language. You have a new tongue. You have a new prayer life. God says it's your indication you've changed rank. So I looked at this, guys, I looked at this, and I'm trying to let you know, Rap City, if you've changed rank, the enemy is mad about you because you've changed rank. You are not the people you were before the conference. I'm trying to let you know, all that he's doing, Janine, you've changed rank. He's mad. He doesn't want you to come to church. He doesn't want you to stay focused. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to do those things because he knows the attack that you will bring to the body of hell is going to change things. So we see in the scripture that we see Paul and Silas take this, so I will stop, is that you see that they get nervous and they said, all right, we're going to apologize and we're going to escort them out. And it made me think of a film, you know, I find um, messages in anything. I watched a series called Prison Break. Prison Break is one of the best series I've ever watched. I binge watched that bad boy. I watched it till like five in the morning, saw the sunrise and everything because it had me gripped. And I like it, for those who haven't seen it, sorry, it's about to be a bit of a spoiler, but we have Michael. Michael goes to jail, not because he did anything. He goes to jail because his brother Lincoln has been put in jail for something he didn't do. And he says, you know what, I'm gonna break you out. And he gets in this situation 
And he gets himself there, gets a clip, and let's play. So here we are. Michael is in this situation. He's being arrested for something he didn't do. Here's Lincoln there. He's about to get killed because that's the law there. He sets up himself so he can be arrested. And he says, no matter my job, no matter my mastermind, on the top of my game, my brother's life is worth it. And he gets in prison. The brother thinks he's dying. He thinks he's going. He thinks that, listen, nothing can happen. But guess what? He realizes, he tries to show him, look, I've got the map of the prison on me. What does that look like? I've got the word inside me. Nothing can stop me. shake this city you're about to shake this nation you're about to see you come from the north the south the east the west it's your time so the attack has been great the enemy has been running rampant i'm not standing here something with something i just coped up but i'm here to let you know he's attacking me he's attacking me he's attacking um, karen mr karen he's attacking rev shot he's attacking caleb he's attacking tj he's attacking all of us but the worst thing you could do is attack a leader because when you do that when you attack the chosen one we get up and we praise we get up and we worship we shout harder we speak in tongues harder because we know we've got the victory so i came to serve notice to every satan that has hold every rat to you friends family in prison every elder every leader guess what you're coming out with victory you're coming out and god says this is the season i'll escort you out i'll make sure you have private security i will make sure that you can't get into a place where you feel like god i'm embarrassed i will come out with my head down god said no you're walking up high so i'm here to let you know it doesn't matter what the enemy did the cost of the call is great. Yes, it doesn't feel great. Sometimes you wonder, God, why am I here? But I wanted to let you know and serve notice and what God said in my spirit is, keep going, keep singing, keep praising, keep hoping, keep dreaming, keep pushing. Because the more you push, the more the enemy realizes he's already lost. Satan has a specific time. The Bible says if we, when we see Satan, we're gonna say, is this him? Is this the one that was troubling us? Which means he's probably some little, little imp. We think it's a man with red horns in a... Please, I promise you, we're going to look and say, is this the guy that we were fretting over? But I want you to know you have backup. I said it this morning at a church where I was preaching. I said, you have to understand, David had the right mindset. He says, listen, you come with a sword, I come with the Lord of hosts. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need a sword. I don't need to argue who I am. I just show up. You're going to miss it. I said, I don't need to argue. Don't believe who I am. Don't believe I'm cool. Don't believe I'm anointed. Don't do all that talking. God says, just show up. When you show up, they'll see for themselves. So lift your hands. My time is gone. I can't do an alcohol like the way I would, but lift your hands. My assignment was to let you know the cost is great. But guess what? You're coming out with victory. So Father, I thank you because I've given the word as you've given it to me. Father, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you will open up their eyes to see. That they will recognize that God, even in the midst of attacks, even in the midst of what the enemy is doing, that they will recognize, Lord God, that you have used them for the, your glory. That everything is aligning itself. That, Father, nothing is hidden, nothing is not happening for them, but God, it is just aligning itself. Father, I ask that you will strengthen every person that feels like giving up. Father, I come against suicidal thoughts. I come against I come against suicidal thoughts. You will not abort your vision. You will not abort what God has called you to. It's not worth dying. You, some, of you, some of you, the enemy has been whispering in your ears. You know what? No one would care if I die. That's a lie. That's a lie. They say some of the biggest gatherings are funerals. So of course people care. 
That's a lie. I command every spirit of suicide to be destroyed right now in the name of Jesus. Depression, oppression, I command it to be destroyed right now. I speak strength. Father, we hold up their arms spiritually just like, Lord God, they did to Moses. Father, we hold them up spiritually. I speak strength back into them. I command strength, strength, strength. I speak to your spirit. I command your spirit to stir back up. I command whatever has been lying dormant to be stirred back up. I command activation in the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare right now, Lord God, Father God, that dreams and visions will come to pass. We come against every enemy that's tried to frustrate, hold up, abort, and cause things not to manifest. I decree that the open heaven has started. I decree September 1st will be a fruition for them. I speak stubborn things that the enemy is doing to stop them from walking in their destiny will be aborted in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood over their mind. I plead the blood over their heart. We come against every accuser. We come against everything that will stop them and we decree that they will have victory. Victory in the name of Jesus. And I speak that acceleration will happen in this last quarter. Things that they've been waiting on. Father God, within the next 90 days, they will see it manifest. I decree in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that families will be saved because of them. In the name of Jesus. I decree, Lord God, parents that have been giving them trouble for coming to church, their hearts will turn. Father, you said in your word, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And you turn it whatsoever way you will. So Father, we speak a turning of hearts. A turning of hearts. In the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you because you're with us. We thank you because you love us. And we thank you because, Lord God, we already have won. And so, Father, we just take this moment to thank you. We thank you for being in the prison with us even when we don't feel you. Father, we thank you for holding us even when we didn't realize we were being held. We thank you because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Thank you for keeping us in our right mind. Thank you for sustaining us. The things we take for granted, the roof over our head. Lord, the finances to get to church every week. Many can't even make it, but you make sure we're able to make it. And so we thank you. We thank you because we know that, Father, we're coming into a season where we will see fruit. And Father, we thank you because... This fruit is not just for us, but it's for everyone in our vicinity. We thank you for London. We thank you for this UK. We thank you because even in the midst of Brexit, you're still in control. We thank you because, Father, you've given us witty inventions on how to sustain irrespective of what's going on in our country. Father, we put our leaders before you. The people you've put in place, Boris, Lord God, whoever they are in their respective places, Father, guide them. Put Christian people and believers in their ears, Lord God. Let them come from the north, south, east and west. Help us to not just want to be on a platform but be in politics. Help us for those who are called to that, Lord God, to find our place. Father, we need you. Our country needs you. And we thank you because, Lord, we know that you know the end from the beginning and everything is well. We thank you because everything is turning for our good. And we give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you believe that God is going to turn some things around for you, come on, make some noise. Come on, let's bless the King of Kings. If you believe that within 90 days, some things are about to be answered. If you believe within 90 days, God's about to tick some things off your list. If you believe within 90 days, God's about to cause some people to get saved in your family. If you believe within 90 days, this place is about to be filled with new young people. If you believe within 90 days, there's about to be peace in our country. If you believe within 90 days, make some noise. Hold on, let me, hold on. Sorry, I'm there pulling you up. Let me tell you something. Last time when the minister, when the, uh, prophesied something was about to happen in 90 days, she was sitting in our house, remember? She said in 90 days something is going to happen. And within that 90 days, what she said was going to happen, happened. I just checked it. It's the 30th of November, 2019. So if you believe the word of God, now I'm not just saying this because I want you to hype and, and get excited. I don't really care if you get it, well, I care if you get it or not, but if, you, if you're going to act cute, then cool. That's fine. I'll get it for myself. So what I want you to do is start to praise God just for 30 seconds. We're late, but just for 30 seconds. Let me tell you why. Because when the woman of God said 90 days, that doesn't mean you're going to have to wait 90 days for it to happen. But 90 days is the end point. So from today onwards, 